Peace and abundance, family. Top of the top, brother MJ. What's up? What's going on? What's up, Deron? How are you? Oh, man, I can't call it, man. I got the notifications. I had to jump in here real quick, see, see what you're talking about. Oh, yeah, for sure, for sure. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Welcome, everybody. Another episode, Market Review. Gonna go over what we, you know, what, what went on in the market today. You know, what we saw. There was a little volatility today. You know, the uh, retail sales numbers came out. Market seemed to react a little bit. We'll get into some of the headlines, look at some charts, um, you know, get a good idea of what, uh, you know, what we can expect moving forward. How y'all doing today? How's everybody doing? All right, so, all right, so let's look, see what we got on, on the headlines today. Um, retail sales numbers came out. Um, the drop was higher than expected. Uh, showing that, you know, the market, uh, the economy is not doing as strong as some people have predicted. Right. Now, if I could bring that up real quick. Right. So, you see here. You know, retail sales drop worse than expected. 1.1% in July as rising COVID fears hit customers, consumers. Right. Now, um, the drop was 1.1% month over month. Um, the expected drop was only 0.3%. So higher than expected, you know, um, you know, the retail sales is used as a gauge, you know, for the economic health. Um, so being as though the drop was stronger than expected, you know, that leads us to believe that, you know, the market is doing a lot better than some will have expected during at this time. Okay. Now, most of the declines came from um, automotive, um, you know, motor vehicles and parts, you know, they declined 3.9%. Um, so that was where majority of the, the declines came from. Now, gas prices and energy prices are, are rising. So we did see a month over month increase in, you know, gasoline sales. And you can expect, you know, a lot of people are, you know, traveling in July. So demand, demand kind of increases uh, for gasoline, um, you know, at this time of the year. All right. Um, but the, you know, the sales dropped 1% month over month, but they're still up about 16% year over year. So, you know, they were slower than expected, but, you know, you can still see that there's, um, you know, year over year, there's still a huge increase, but, you know, month over month, it was um, lower than expected. Now, um, Fed meeting this week, I believe Jerome has some things to say today. Um, you know, the central bank officials are saying that inflation has met the 2% mandate, right? Um, but, you know, they're looking for, you know, a stronger labor market. So these next, you know, data points as far as unemployment, 
and employment numbers coming out over these next uh, month or two is going to be really important um, for the market. Um, as we get, uh, as the Fed has been saying this week that, you know, they're getting closer to tapering of the bonds. So, you know, they, they're saying if the job market continues to improve, um, they will begin tapering before the end of the year. Uh, so keep your eye on the economic data points as they come out over this next month um, in regards to employment and unemployment. As you know, that could be a huge catalyst uh, for a correction or some type of move in the market. Um, another headline today was uh, Michael Burry um, and Kathy. So um, this time of the year, um, the 13F filings, uh, the 13F filings have been uh, widely released this, this, um, this week. And for those that don't know, the 13F filings are just, you know, um, companies have to file a 13F on a quarterly basis to basically um, disclose their trades made within the quarter, right? Um, so second quarter, um, second quarter um, 13 Fs are coming out. Uh, usually like after the quarter ends, which will be uh, June, they give, they give them like a month or like, I guess like four to six weeks to file, make those filings and disclose what their trades did. And, you know, as those uh, are coming out, and you can use um, Will Wisdom, of course, to track, you know, um, with what, uh, you know, the institutions and hedge funds are doing, because all accredited uh, institutions and hedge funds, they have to do their quarterly 13F filings to basically disclose, you know, what moves they made uh, throughout the quarter. Now, it was found that um, Michael Burry, who's famous for you know, um, shorting the housing market prior to the 2008 crash. Um, one of the greatest trades in history. Um, he's known for, you know, predicting different crashes and, you know, shorting companies. But the 13F filings disclosed that his, um, his hedge fund, which is, I, be, I believe, Scion, um, they had purchased over 2,000 put contracts on ARC um, in the second quarter. So this was between April and June um, that he purchased over 2,000 put contracts on ARKK, right? And he held them through the quarter. So he could very much still own these positions. Um, and, you know, Michael Burry, uh, he's been right before. Doesn't mean that, you know, he's right, but, you know, we did see ARC slide over these last uh, couple of months, uh, but picked up a very heavy short position um, on ARC. And today, Kathy came out with a tweet saying, to his credit, Michael Burry made a great call based on fundamentals and recognized the calamity brewing in the housing mortgage market. I do not believe that he understands the fundamentals that are creating explosive growth and investment opportunities in the innovation space, right? In our view, the seeds of, for innovation explosion that ARK Invest is dedicated to researching were planted during the 20 years ending with the tech and telecom bus. Having just stated for more than 20 years, these technologies should transform the world during the next 10 years. So Kathy coming out, defending ARC, defending her ETF. Um, but, you know, it's been revealed that Michael Burry does have a huge short position now. He's also known for shorting Tesla as well. Um, so, uh, but, you know, he's, he's somebody to keep your eye on. Um, but let's look at the, let's look at the ARC chart real quick. to get a better, uh, bring more clarity and see how, you know, these, these puts may have been performing uh, during that time. Now, so looking at ARC, 
Now you can see. So if he picked up these positions during second quarter, that means he picked them up between April, May, or June. Right. And you can see that, you know, Arc has had a huge fall, you know, since February, March, um, and came down. Now we don't know exactly when these puts were purchased, um, but I'm guessing he's betting on you know, Arc experiencing another leg down, right? Now we know that Arc is Tesla heavy, Square heavy, Roku heavy, Teladoc heavy, you know, all um, innovation companies. We did break this trend line this week. Um, you know, this trend line that was acting as support on our way up. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if we do pull back a little bit. Um, First level, I have a weekly demand at 112, 113 area. And then um, next level I have is the 104, 105 area. Um, but that, um, you know, ARC has a lot of support around $100. Um, you can see that it came down to this level in May, tested around this level in March. Um, so, you know, watch these, you know, this hundred dollar level, 105 level um, as potential levels to find that ARC find support. Now, if we do correct, it could, uh, we could see it come back down to the support level at uh, around 92, 93. Right. Um, but I thought that was really interesting, you know, Michael Burry coming out. Uh, he has been a huge Tesla bear, so it's not that surprising. Um, but definitely check out your uh, the different institutions and hedge funds. And you can also you can also search by company and find out, you know, um, how different institutions and hedge funds are positioned for that specific. Um, ETF or stock. Right. And then you could come here. Uh, so like, for example, if I click in Tesla, I can come here and see, you know, if the increase, um, if, you know, if institutions, if more institutions enter new positions or closed previous positions, um, if more people built on their positions, you know, the total cost, the puts, and you can see more puts were bought last quarter. Um, we grew from 142 million to 192 million. So a lot of puts were placed on Tesla. More, more puts than calls. Um, but you can see 118 institutions closed their positions, right? 872 increased their positions, 156, you know, took new positions in Tesla. So, you know, this is another tool or resource you can use. Now let's look at, you know, our gainers for the day. All right. Monday.com, Moderna, BioNTech. Now there was news, um, the World Health Organization. Can you guys see my screen? Hold on, let me make sure. Can you see the Yahoo Finance? Somebody put a one in the chat if y'all can see my screen. All right, cool. So Moderna, you know, we were talking a lot about Moderna last week. Um, we did mark out that daily demand that I was speaking about. All right, remember we marked this daily demand on market review last week. Now we came into that zone yesterday and today, and you can see, you know, uh, stock went up $28 today from that zone we had drew last week. And I was saying, you know, I would like to see Moderna come back down to that 360 level and that 38.2 fib. And I was saying that usually when you see that 38.2 fib lining up with that demand zone, um, usually that indicates that that's probably a strong 
level of where we'll see increased buying. Um, and as y'all can see, that's exactly what happened. We came back into our daily demand yesterday and today. Um, and we had a nice bounce. Uh, let's go to the 15 minute. Had a nice bounce. Um, yesterday had a nice bounce and today out of our, our daily demand. So you could have caught this um, and it would have been a nice uh, day trade, swing trade, right? The technicals backed it up. Uh, let's look at bio and tech. Um, now looking at bio and tech, we were talking about this one too. Um, and I was saying, watch that 38.2 level. Now you can see we came down to that 38.2 level yesterday and today, and we had another bounce. Bio and tech up $23 today. So, you know, those levels that we marked uh, last week, they ended up working out. As you can see, bio and tech came down to this 38.2. You can see we bounced right off that 38.2 level yesterday. This morning, pre-market and at, at the open, we came down to this 38.2 level and bounced again. Let's just see what, you know, if you would have played that, uh, what that trade could have did. Right, let's see, bio and tech. So came down to that around that 321, 320 level. Now let's say, you know, you got in yesterday or today. Uh, say you got in yesterday or today. And let's say, uh, these contracts are, are, are kind of expensive for this week to be this week expiration, but let's just hypothetically look at, you know, the move on some of these contracts. Um, so this uh, BioNTech 350 call went from $2.60 to $25 today. Um, so $260 could have turned into almost $2,500 um, if you were able to catch it off that demand zone. Um, now, I do want to talk about VIX and SQQQ. Um, they started moving today. Um, and you guys know I've been raving about uh, the VIX and SQQQ. And also I spoke about, um, I spoke about Microsoft puts. So I wanna touch on a couple of those. Let's bring up the VIX. So you can see the VIX hit a high in 1956 today. Um, VIX hit a high of 1956, nice move. Um, those contracts uh, moved pretty well today, uh, those VIX, VIX calls. And you can see it wasn't even that much of a, you know, just, a, just was a small pullback today, nothing really major, but you can see that spike in the VIX, we almost hit 20 just from, you know, just a little volatility today. Right. Um, those contracts were moving really good. Um, definitely, definitely look at um, SQQQ. Um, these contracts are really cheap, um, really, really cheap. Like I was saying to you guys, um, and these contracts were moving today as well. Um, like I was saying, I, you know, I started scaling into the Decembers, um, going all the way out to December, they're still only going for 90 cents, right? Now you can see we had a nice pop, um, 
and SQQQ today. It looks like it could be forming a nice cup and handle here. All right, cup, handle. Um, but you can see we, we had a nice bounce to eight, $8.40. Um, so watch that. These contracts are moving really good. These SQQQ, if you want to um, hedge your tech and hedge your, uh, and, you know, short QQQ as we go into this, uh, this time of the year. Um, and like I was saying, the chain, the option chain looks really good. The risk to reward is really good on these as well. So keep your eye on SQQQ. Now, um, I was talking about Microsoft puts um, last week and yesterday. Uh, Microsoft um, at one point was down almost three dollars today. Um, ended up bouncing a little bit. Now, what's cool is remember I was telling you guys about the implied volatility being so low on Microsoft. I'll add that IV. Now you can see over these last couple of days, you can see there was a you know a nice spike in the IV. Right. Um, looking at the very bottom, see our IV hit. Uh, you know, at the end, towards the end of the end of last week, our IV was as low as eighteen nineteen. Um, today it hit twenty two. Um, and you guys might not think that's a lot, but you know, even that's still like a 16% increase, right? From 19 to 22, that's still a 16% increase um, in the IV, right? So as Microsoft dropped, like I said, I've, I've started scaling into October puts. Now, the cool thing about it is, even as Microsoft was increasing today, my puts. We're still going up in value, right? Of course, they were up because it was down, but they were also going up in value as this IV increased, right? So even though you know Microsoft was going against my position, because I was able to catch these puts um, before this small increase in the IV, even during the afternoon, as Microsoft was going up, my puts were still going up in value, right? which is pretty dope. Now, if we look at it on a four hour, we can see, you know, sellers starting to show presence. Um, there is a four hour demand at 289. Um, but I will be really cautious um, getting calls right now in some of these tech positions because a lot of them are showing, you know, seasonality, um, you know, as we get closer to September, they're not really strong at these times of the year. Um, but yeah, so for those that actually got in those Microsoft puts, you know, those contracts were up, up nice today due to the fact of the drop and due to the fact of the IV as well. Um, can you set alerts on IV? Um, I've tried, I haven't, um, I think you can. Um, so when you go to set an alert, I believe you have to, you have to do study, right? Um, you have to do study and then you can go in here and edit to imply volatility and then set it at a specific level when you do it. So that would be going into create alert, change from price from mark to study, go to edit. Um, and then you would change, you know, your study to from simple moving average to uh, imply volatility. And then you can set it at crossing above or below a specific value. Yeah. 
me personally, I just I just watch it. I just like to pay attention to it. Uh, but you can set alerts if you want to uh, go into there, uh, go into the alert and edit it and customize it. All right. Now let's look at the overall market. Let's look at the S and P. Now this could be a dead cat bounce where you know we bounce today and then we continue uh, lower tomorrow. We broke through our demand zones. We broke through our demand zones today. And you can see, you know, price started to reverse at that uh, lower price channel. Now this uh, this level that we're at is a previous area of resistance um, that's basically turning into support. So let me move this so you guys can see a little better. All right, so going back here, you can see that you know. This level that we bounced off, right? That was resistance. Um, is the level that we bounced off today. So I like to go back in time and look at you know different areas of resistance that could turn price um, into support to give me a better edge to see where buyers could re-enter the market. Right. Um, now you can see here, this same level um, lines up perfectly with our three hour demand going back to August 5th. Right. Um, we basically uh, bounced off this level to the penny today. So you can see 44.12. Um, so you can see this level from our three hour demand started at 44.12. Today we came down to 44.12 and 25 cents and then 40 and then um, we came down to 44.11 and 75 cents. So almost a perfect bounce off of this uh, three hour demand here. You can see you came down here around one o'clock, tested that demand zone perfectly, created this double bottom, and then we uh, continued uh, to move back up. Do you go out of the money, even though it's only a few months out until expiration? Um, Barrett, um, he says, do you go out of the money even though it's only a few months out until expiration on my puts? Um, on, on, what, on, what, on what ticker though? Are you talking about QQQ or, or just on any individual stock? Yeah, I like to play at the money. Um, so like one, one out, like one basically at the money or I'll go a couple out the money. Like for SQQ, SQQQ, I, I, I did $10 calls, um, which is a, is a couple out of the money. Just depends on when my expiration is. Um, and you know, I like to base it off the technicals as well, right? Where my price target may be, right? The reason I like the 10 call is because if if we do get a correction, I see SQQQ getting back up to 10, right? We hit 9.3 and that was a small pullback. So my hypothesis is that if we do experience a 10% move, you know, that should bring us, you know, above this 9.3 level and close to that 10 or even above. Um, it, uh, does it, uh, Mike says, does it make sense to do SQQQ further out? 
Um, there's a January 2023, or should SQQQ option be only used as a short-term trade slash hedge? Um, it depends on what you what you uh, what your high, what your trade thesis is, right? Um, um, you know, I don't. It doesn't to me. It doesn't make sense to play SQQQ. First of all, it's not a mean reverting um, index, so it's not like the VIX where it, it you know it trades within a standard deviation to the mean. SQQ is usually always in a downtrend because tech is always in an uptrend. So um, the reason you would be playing SQQQ is hedge against your tech positions or you know, to capitalize on the downside of QQQ, NASDAQ and tech companies. Um, but to go so far out as to a 2023, you're basically saying that you expect, you know, you were kind of expecting us to go into a bear market. Um, that's the only way it would make sense to go that far out on those if you're expecting us to go into a bear market and for us to continue to slide. But if you think we're just gonna experience, you know, short-term volatility and pullback correction, um, I don't think you need to go out that far. Yeah. All right. Um, what else we got? So Moderna Biotech goes Monday.com. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not familiar with that company. Um, but it had a had a pretty strong day today. Um, I have to do more research on this company to find out, you know, what's going on with it or why it, uh, you know, why it has such a strong move. Uh, but we will we'll probably experience more volatility um, tomorrow. You can look at the S&P now. We're most likely going to enter, which we did, we entered the supply zone and you can see sellers are showing presence. This one hour supply, which, which was created this morning. Um, we just entered that supply at, at close. So we just entered the supply. Um, and you can see price reacting to that zone. Now, a good way to catch, um, you know, as price makes these strong moves down, you wanna mark these different uh, supply zones. So when price comes back in, there's a good chance that the move may continue, right? And they call this like a dead cat bounce where price makes a strong move, we get a bounce, and then price, you know, the sellers will re-enter and continue to move to the downside. Uh, sometimes I like to throw the fibs on it to give me a better idea of where sellers could re-enter and can continue to push price back down. Now you can see um, price came back up to this 50% fib, almost to the penny, um, and sellers started to come in strong right at our 50% fib. Um, but we did get a perfect bounce from this three hour demand today, going back to, um, you know, two weeks ago, early August. Okay. Uh, let's look at the NASDAQ. Um, NASDAQ also had a, had a nice move There was a 30 minute demand at, at 14,908. Uh, and I, you know, I was kind of expecting us to bounce here around this time. We were already in a demand zone. Um, and then we came back to this level that was created early August. This 30 minute demand, and then also this key level at, and I'll remove the fib so you guys can see. Um, there was a key level at 
uh, right below our 30 minutes demand, which is like 14, 9, 05, and 25. Um, so you can see here that, you know, when I put on the five minute, you can see all, it was almost a perfect bounce. So we came right into this, to this, to this key level in this 30 minute demand, created a double bottom here, and then we continued um, to move up. Right. So when, when you have these levels marked, you can capitalize off the volatility. Um, I actually took a quick trade on um, on QQQ, quick scalp when it came into this demand. Um, quick scalp got in and out. These contracts were up 30% at one time. Um, just capitalizing off this the buyers at this area, at this demand. Now, um, looking at potential supply zones on our way up. Now there is a 30 minute supply here. Um, I identify the supply and demand zones just by, you know, the candlestick formation. I'm looking for um, basing candles and, and then strong drops or strong rallies to indicate an increase of demand or an increase of supply. So you can see here, we have a supply. So we might rally back into the zone And then sellers can re-enter. But like I said, you know, it's kind of hard to predict, you know, how the market will react this week because there's so many different factors, COVID, um, bond tapering, um, economic data, like retail sales and things like that. Um, so any trades that you guys do take this week, make sure you're not putting on too much risk. Cause it's hard, it's kind of hard to predict where we can go, but definitely start marking off the levels for the positions that you do want, you know, um, for the positions that you do want. So if, and when we do correct, you know, you know, the exact levels that you want to get in, All right? Mark those, start mar marking those levels off now. Look at, you know, how much the, you know, these stocks or ETFs corrected last year during this time. So you can kind of estimate where price could go if um, the market does decide to correct and then provide a great risk to reward to ride, um, even get your leaps, you know, your long-term contracts when it pulls back or corrects and then just ride those up, right? You know, your position always is the maximum um, opportunity or risk to reward when you know everybody is scared and the market is selling off, those contracts become um, really cheap. Um, I did forget to mention there was news um, in the there was news about Square. Oh, not Square. Um, I should say Jack Dorsey. Jack Dorsey is working on a decentralized social network. I don't know if you guys saw that news this morning. Um, it's calling it Blue Sky. Uh, so this would, you know, I know you guys have heard of decentralized finance, but now Jack Dorsey is looking into decentralized social networks. Uh, so that's that's really interesting. Uh, this guy, this guy gets no sleep. Um, he, uh, he's the CEO of Square and Twitter, and they just purchased Tidal. Um, and now he's working on, um, you know, a decentralized social network, one of my favorite CEOs. Um, but, you know, this is really interesting. Um, you know, this could be very disruptive in this industry. Um, and him being the CEO of Twitter could very, you know, he could tie that into Twitter and add more value to Twitter as well. Um, but 
you know, just just a headline that I saw today that was uh, that was real um, interesting. All right. So keep your eye on this um, as this develops. All right, this could be really disruptive and groundbreaking. Um, also, you know, the World Health Organization was saying that there's there's increased risk of hospitalization um, for you know people with the Delta um, virus. So, you know, COVID is getting worse. Um, we can look at the chart and see, you know, how bad we're getting. Um, and you can see the new cases on a daily basis are, you know, are rising. Um, So it doesn't seem like things are getting better. You know, different countries are, are locking down. People, different states are putting stricter um, mask mandates out right now. Um, so like we're seeing the, we're seeing, you know, BioNTech and Moderna move again. So, um, and this is another risk to the market. Uh, so I hope you guys started getting positioned, um, started moving some money around because you don't want to get caught holding the bag. Um, so explore different ways you can hedge, uh, different ways that um, different ways that you can take advantage of this potential downside in the market. Um, any questions, comments, concerns? Now, as far as earnings, um, not a real huge week in earnings. Wait, MJ, I have a question real quick. <clears throat> What's good, bro? Um, talking about NVIDIA, where do you see NVIDIA going? I don't know if you can pull, pull that chart up real quick. Do you see NVIDIA um, heading down? towards this um, period as well? Yeah, I think that's, um, I think that's, uh, that's likely. I mean, me personally, I've been, I've been waiting patient to get in. Um, it didn't fall as much as I expected um, due to the split. Now, if we're looking at historically what it tends to do, during you know periods of correction, we can look at last year. Last year during this time in September, we came down about twenty percent, and then in October we came down around um, another twenty percent, right? This year in March, February, March, we came down around 24, 24%. Now it does look like it's forming a double top here. You can see we made a top in July, came back up. Um, this is a weekly chart, by the way. Uh, hammer candle at the top of the trend. That's usually a, a bearish sign. And you can see sellers are starting to take profits now. Um, 175 is an interesting level to, to, to watch. Um, I do want it, I, I would love to see it come to this daily demand at 157. Um, that's where, that's the area that I'm targeting. Uh, that would be about a 25% uh, correction from its highs, right? Lining right up with our daily demand. Now we can add our 200, add our 200 day. Right. See our 200 day is close to that demand area at uh, 152. Um, 
so we have stack demands kind of, we have another daily demand at 162. Um, but if we if we correct 25% from the highs, that would put us right around that 160 area, which about would line us up with around our 200 day moving average, which I think is a, a great area to buy. Now, lastly, um, we could throw our fib on it. Um, and our daily demand uh, is right in between our 61.8 and our 50. Um, I do like the 175 area too, um, but it could very well break that area of support. That lines up with our 38.2. We, we have a 38.2 fib around 173. Um, and then, you know, our, our daily demand lines up with our 50% fib at 162. Um, so I'm watching the 150 to 160 area as a potential area to, uh, to get in NVIDIA based on um, those factors. Cool, I like that, thank you. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Aki was good. I mean, I asked because, you know, I saw them, I did see them gaps down there around like the 140, I think it's like the 145. I think it was 145. Yeah, there is a gap from 148. Two gaps. Yep. Yep, there's one so, at, from 148 to 146. And then um, there's another gap from 140 uh, to 143. Yeah, so I figured that they'd be trying to come down there Maybe try to do some <clears throat> some unfinished business in that area. I mean, obviously, you know, it's a quite a while away, but I still think that yeah. it might uh, come close to that. Right now, there, there there's a weekly demand at at one twenty nine. Um, so if we do break, you know, you know, one fifty, and we come down. Um, um, to close those gaps, um, you know, there was previous support at 135, um, but, you know, if it comes, if it enters this weekly demand at 129, I would put on a significant position because it'll be very much oversold at these levels and, and, and very much on sale. All right. um, but the first level I would probably begin to scale in would be you know one 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 fifty seven one sixty area, um, and like Duran said, um, there's gaps that have not been filled yet. Um, at uh, one forty eight and um, one forty two to one forty, right, and that you know. And our 200 days trading, you know, near that around 152 as well. Aki, you got your hand up? Yeah, yeah. I was just waiting for y'all for you to talk. Um, so what is your, your opinion on um, the, the COVID scare, right? But, okay, so last time COVID happened, we didn't have a vaccine. Now we got about three or four of them if we just talk about the United States. Um, and I know inflation is up, but jobs aren't still where they need to be. Um, and what if the Fed doesn't start tapering bonds? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, this is, this is a real interesting time um it's important that we keep our eyes on you know what the fed is doing you know uh and the different economic economic data points that are coming out to further give us clarity on where we could be moving towards 
you know, is, yeah, that's very possible. Um, and that's why, you know, you know, as these job numbers come out, they're going to be very important because that's what the Fed is going to be looking at uh, to make their decision. Uh, so, you know, if the Fed, you know, the meeting is, you know, September 22nd, that meeting where the Fed could announce that they're tapering, I'm still expecting some volatility as we go into that meeting. Um, um, you know, I, I'm accumulating more cash right now to prepare for any volatility, uh, positioning myself personally, because I don't want to get caught in any hay made with my, you know, my long, my position getting hit hard during the correction. Uh, but if the Fed comes out, says we're not tapering, which it very much could do. Um, we're still we're still at a time in the market, September, where we get a correction. Now, it's very possible that we correct going into that meeting, right? Because if you remember last year, all right, let's look at last year real quick. Now, if you remember last year, our low was September 24th, right? Um, so it's very possible that um, in anticipation of the meeting, we correct like we did last year. And then when the meeting actually does happen, which is, I believe, the 22nd and the 23rd, and the Fed could come out and say we're not tapering, that could be the catalyst for the market to get bullish and you know us move back up right so you can always use the data points historical data to kind of formulate you know a hypothesis but you know i think that we could correct going into the fed meeting and then the fed you know calming some worries um says we're not you know uh, you know employment numbers aren't strong enough and we're not tapering and the market getting confidence and we move back up like we did last year and, and then possibly we pull back again before we finally, you know, get into that Christmas rally. Right. So I don't, I don't know what the Fed is gonna do, but you know, you always wanna be prepared for any scenario, you know, cause it's all probability. So you wanna have, you know, if this happens, this is what I'll do. If this happens, this is what I'll do. All right, another question. Um... I'm flipping it out. What do you think? What what will cause us to go back to uh, have a 2018 September to uh, December drop? Uh, I think a lockdown. I think um, if we look at 2018 to see um, us basically rallying a whole year um, from like. Uh, from like March, we rallied the whole year. And then from September, uh, from like mid-September to the end of the year, um, we fell, we fell extremely hard. So I think the biggest risk right now is, is COVID. So I think if we do go back into a lockdown, you know, that'll, you know, that'll hurt, how to hurt us economically. And that could, you know, that could be the catalyst for a type of move like we saw in 2018. Um, so that 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 would be crazy. Now, a lockdown isn't out of the question. Uh, I know Biden says he's not gonna do it, uh, but if things get bad enough, I don't really think he has an option. Um, but other than, other than a lockdown, you know, if the Fed says, yeah, I know we said we weren't raising rates, but yeah, we raising rates. <laughs> If they came out and said that, um, you know, a whole year or two years ahead of schedule, I think, you know, that would that would scare the market pretty bad and cause this type of move. Um, but I think those are the two main risks right now, as far as the market goes, is the the virus um, and policy and federal policy, monetary policy. So those are the things that we have to keep, uh, you know, keep our eye out for. And we can use the economic data, um, employment numbers to give us an idea of, you know, where the Fed uh, could be going over these next couple of weeks. 
Uh, but like I said, you know, we're going to experience some volatility midweek like we saw today. We saw the uh, the VIX spike a little bit. I think this is only the beginning. Um, so, you know, like I said, um, I'm urging y'all to definitely start to explore different ways to hedge. Um, you know, it, it definitely benefits um, your portfolio. Okay. But always remember, anything is possible. Like no scenario is out of the question. Um, like I always say, it's all probability. So, you know, the probability of, you know, the Fed raising rates, um, I don't know that. I don't know that probability, but I know that there's a good chance. Well, not, should I say, not raising rates, but um, tapering of the bonds, because that would be the first step. Um, but we can use the employment numbers as a gauge, right? But whether or not, you know, like I said, I do think we still experience volatility as we as we go into September, as people start to take risk off the tables. Um, looking at the 10 year, 10 years in that bullish flag is trading around that 38.2 level. Um, so, you know, keep your eye out on, um, you know, the bonds as well. This is that an interesting area? You can see a lot of buy pressure um, here, and we're trading around that uh, that lower weekly Bollinger Band. Um. So yeah. Um. Any any anything else anybody want to bring up, or any anything else on people's minds before we uh before we get off of here. Appreciate y'all for joining me again. Um, any last questions, comments, concerns? I got one more. All right, so right now the uh, Midwest is having a drought um, that doesn't look like it's gonna get better. Could that be a catalyst uh, to cause some uh, hurt in the market that we, we don't see coming? Um, it could, it could, um, um, I'm not, you know, it's hard to tell, you know, what, you know, how the market is weighing that, um, uh, based on everything else that's going on. Uh, but you know, you things like that, you want to pay attention to because you're not really sure how the market could react to that. Um, so that's something to watch, you know, I would keep my eye out on it, but I do believe that, you know, COVID and, you know, the bond market uh, is the main focus right now, but, you know, it could, there all can always be, you know, different factors that could impact the market moving forward, like a drought or, you know, any other things or global uh, micro and macro macroeconomic factors. So I'm not I'm not too sure how the market will you know react to that. Um, but you know you always want to keep your eye out for things that could put you know different sectors or different stocks at risk. What's your What's your opinion, Aki? What do you think? Um, I mean if it, if it if it doesn't get under control, um, I mean, right now they're battling out to determine, you know, how, okay, so every seven years they need to, the states have to battle out or negotiate, you know, how they're going to spend, where does water go? Okay, does it go to the city? Does, does the agriculture get an, uh, a surplus? So um, right now the Hoover Dam's at, uh, since beginning year low, I think the levels are like, 1,076, uh, if it gets a 950, Hoover Dam goes offline, you know, and that that provides power for a lot of different states. Um, example, Nevada. So I'm just looking at that chain reaction um, on like, you know, what, what like do renewables step into play? Um, you know, example, wind, sun. So that would be a perfect opportunity to get like a 10. Uh, 
should that happen um, in terms of drinking water, the American Water Company, I think, uh, I don't know, Polar Springs or, 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 <clears throat> or Coca-Cola would be an opportunity, um, you know, as because they provide uh, drinking water. But again, it's just more thinking like a chain reaction setup of how do we benefit I'm sorry, how can we capitalize, you know, should the polar, uh, should we get another winter where there's less snowfall, which impacts uh, water uh, building up in, in, the, in the lakes and the dam. Um, so just something to think about. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, you can see that uh, these water ETFs have been on a tear. Um, and, you know, that's a natural resource um, that, you know, people have grown increasingly interested in um, over these last couple of months. And you can see, you know, FIW, um, CGW, these water ETFs have been making nice moves here. Uh, PHO, right? Um, a couple of these water ETFs have been making strong moves. Now we'll see how, you know, a drought or something like that could affect them. So I would keep my eye on these. Um, we are at the top of the uh, weekly Bollinger Band. Um, so if you look at the RSI, we are overbought on a lot of these ETFs. So, um, you know, could be an opportunity um, as these droughts could hurt hurt these uh, these companies. I would look into the companies inside the ETFs to see which companies would be the most affected and, and formulate a thesis there. Um, but yeah, so quick review. Um, we talked about retail sales. Um, we looked at, you know, S&P 500. Saw how it bounced right off our three hour demand today. Um, so, you know, go back in and check that out. Um, talked about Kathy Wood and Michael Burry shorting ARC. Um, we talked about the risk of COVID. And we talked about, you know, different ways to hedge using the VIX and SQQQQ. I think that was too many Qs, SQQQ. <laughs> so, I uh, hope it was valuable info. Um, you know, a couple of these things that we have been talking about have been um, coming to fruition. So um, we'll keep doing these uh, as we can find different opportunities. Uh, so love y'all. Appreciate y'all. Thanks for tuning in. I'll post a recording. The recording will be on YouTube by tonight. So uh, much love, everybody. Thanks for Thanks for joining. And we'll also talk to y'all tomorrow. Reach out if you have any questions or anything like that. All right, peace, everybody.